Hallelujah. Amen. I started to sing myself, but after Brother Larry sang, I didn't have the guts. Amen. I'm not going to say whether I didn't have the guts because I was too ashamed or I didn't want to make him look bad. I'll let y'all figure that out for yourself. Uh, what a beautiful voice. When he called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever, everybody say whosoever, will come after me. Brother Billy, that's not everybody. There's a qualifier there. Everybody would like to. Even those that don't believe in God would like what God has to offer. Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. I got to preach to you tonight. A little bit of pastor preaching. Um, I want to preach to you on this subject. Consider your ways. Consider your ways. Dear Holy Lord Jesus, this has been a good service tonight, Lord. The singing's been good and the praise has just been great. It's been wonderful. I felt your presence and I'm so excited about that. It's, it's a blessing to know that you are with us, that you're not a story and that you're not a God that's far off, but you're a God that's at hand, especially when we come together and begin to praise you. I'm so glad I felt your spirit. I pray, Lord, that you will let me preach tonight what you want me to say. It don't ha it's not my notes. I, I'm not not really happy with how I've laid out my notes here, but I know the message and I know the word that's got to be presented. And I pray, God, that you will help me, help me speak and articulate this in the way. Use my lips. Use my lips, Lord, as an instrument of your use. Use me, O oh Lord, as I'm pliable in your hands, because I know where you want to take these people. I know where we're going, God, and I pray that we together help them get there in Jesus name amen and you may be seated God bless you for standing in honor of the reading of the word of the Lord I'm reading I was talking to sister Maria last evening and uh, I uh, I've got a bad habit going lately as I get started on a book and I like it so good, Brother Billy, before I get about two chapters in it, I give it away to somebody. And I've done that several times lately, and I've got several books that I've started, and I just read two or three chapters in them, and then uh, uh, I've, I've got them bookmarked, and I read a chapter here, I read a chapter there, and, and I, I carry them with me here to the church, and I read. And uh, I know some of you don't like to read, or have difficulties reading, and uh, I, I really feel sorry for you that you can't read or that you don't like to read. That's the ones I really feel sorry for because uh, books can speak to you. Books can speak to you, and the, it's like, kind of like reading the Bible. No two times will you read the Bible through and it say the same thing to you. No two times. And I'm reading at least two books now. I've got several more, but two that come to my mind. One dealing with teamwork and one dealing with men's ministry. But they both spoke to me of the same thing. The key to establishing a thriving, revival, local church ministry is to get everybody on the same page. Can I get an amen? We live in the most detached a individually detached world that has ever existed. The people in the, in the prairie days were more connected than we are. They would ride for days. They would ride for miles to go to a barn raising one night, Brother Pete, a dance the next night or a box supper, and then they'd have church in the same place on Saturday and ride home for hours They would to, in order to come together. 
But we have got to, with the help of the Holy Ghost and, and with teaching and, and seeking after what the Lord wants, uh, we have to all get on the same page. Jesus began His church with a motley crew of twelve mismatched men that He taught and corrected and involved, preparing them for what would ultimately begin 50 days after Calvary, Pentecost, one accord in one place, the Bible describes them, the characteristics are there. They were with one accord in one place. And I've told you often that that word accord could maybe be better rendered in harmony. Kind of like when they sing up here and they sing the different parts. But Brother McKinney, it melds together with a, with a beautiful harmony. It's different ideas and different, uh, from a different perspective, but it all comes together in accord. That's what they were. One place and one accord on the day of Pentecost. We don't have too many issues with the place. We have quite a number of solid, faithful people that are always here and I'm grateful for it. I said I'm grateful for it. Faithfulness is something that is dying. But it is something that as a child of God you cannot turn loose of. Because the Bible says when the Son of Man returns, will He find faith on the earth? I want to be faithful. We don't have too many issues with the place coming together into one place. But we do have some issues with accord, being in accord. The twelve disciples were from many different walks of life. Admittedly, some of them unlearned and ignorant. Some of them despised. Matthew comes to mind. The publican, but through the direction of Jesus Christ and through the, the careful molding of the Spirit, they were able to come in a way that, in a, together in a way that far supersedes their location. Because you can be in a crowded room in this day that we live and be completely by yourself, completely alone, completely detached. Today I watched us as we sat at the dinner table waiting on our food to come. And they brought our food and, and how, Brother Ray and I talked about it Friday, how uh, we've got so much. And they're standing there with their food and they're calling our, our orders out. And, and some of us were so enamored with whatever was on our phone that they're standing there holding our food right beside us. We haven't eaten today and we, we just stayed glued to what was there and, and uh, not even acknowledging who was standing next to us. And I speak that with no malice or, or no condemnation, but it is become a way of life. We are so detached. But the Lord took the disciples and He molded them and shaped them. And I have to tell you tonight under the authority of the Holy Ghost that that's what God is going to do here. It may be some cases by addition and it may be some cases by subtraction. But when the Lord gets through with us, we're going to be the church that He wants us to be. It's not just coming together in the same location that makes you together. But it is also being in one accord. The direction that the Holy Ghost has led me to for tonight comes from the knowledge that there are some incredibly anointed, talented, and capable men and women in this church. There are some incredibly anointed, talented, gifted, capable men and women in this church, quite frankly, in many ways more so than myself. The book I'm reading, one of the aforementioned books dealing with men's ministry, describes what I'm trying to say in a manner that allows me to express it like this. Anointed, talented, and capable men and women under the influence of the Holy Ghost are able to positively influence not only their church, but the entire fabric of the society in which they live. According to the book, we are as sticks of dynamite as we with our effectiveness explode and create a blast zone that is evident in school, that's evident on the job, not only operating in church, but having the same sort of effect on our communities as we do in the church. Amen. The abilities, the talents, the anointing, the giftings, the ministries that are present in this small assembly are capable not only of what we achieve here at church but of impacting our communities in a manner just as we do in the house of God can I get an amen, amen. by the same token 
When these same people operate from a carnal place, when they go off, as it were, keeping with the dynamite metaphor, they produce blast zones of death and massive collateral damage. As folks, as folks self-preserve, self-protect, self-indulge, and seek to be self-important even at the expense of others. In a time, please receive this as the word of the Lord from your pastor tonight. In a time that our local culture is in the tumult and disarray. When there's many questions. In a time of less jobs than there are people to go around for. When, when men such as, as Brother Larry and Brother Robbie are going to have to return to school and, and get an education in order to follow another career path. Uh, it, it, things are not... They, they, this is not how we intended it. Even, even as little as a year ago, there were plans that were made and there were things put in place. Uh, but here in our community, it has now been blown up. Uh, and sometimes some people have no clue where they're headed. But this church, in the middle... Brother Pete, think about 20 years ago. If somebody would have said Naranda was shut down, within six months this would all be ghost towns. Yet in the middle of a, a cultural disarray, in the middle of a tumult, this church not only manages to survive, but we're growing. This church, please read, and I told our mayor this the other day, this church is representative of what God can do in this community. It doesn't matter about jobs. It, the Lord has got His hand on us, and this church is flourishing. This church is growing. Hear me now. This church, this church is bringing people to New Madrid. This church is. This church is growing, prospering, and excelling. We have people from as many, I believe, 14, 15 different communities that drive into our church. But the impetus for you talented men and women as I sat in prayer and as I sat fasting and seeking after the Lord for you, the impetus behind this message is for us to be delivered from the selfishness that rears its head up in us every time that we start getting close to where we're supposed to be. It rears its head. It rears, rears its head up every time that we begin to, to walk in the fulfillment and the flow of the Holy Ghost. The enemy of selfishness rears its head up in us once again. And we start making our own tracks, making our own path, and detaching ourselves. Selfish manifests itself in so many ways. The most common of which, of course, is when two children, I watch them around here sometimes, when one child will bring a truck or one child will bring a dog and they'll hold it in their arm and another child looks at it with such longing and with such, a, and with such passion and, and I want it. And, and there is nothing short of moving heaven or earth that's going to make that child give up that toy because they're selfish. But when everything you do, even to the point of serving others, becomes about you, when your every thought, whether it be your health, your finances, your marriage, your kids, your friends, your enemies, etc., ultimately ends up with this focus at your own doorstep, you have lost your effectiveness for the kingdom of God. And your world is slowly slipping away, ultimately being sacrificed on, on the altar of self-preservation, which is completely contrary to what anyone who chooses to follow Jesus Christ must do. He said, if any man, whosoever, will follow me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me, Brother Larry sang that song tonight. He sang it under the leading of the Holy Ghost because I couldn't help but think as I sat over there in my seat, God, forgive me for complaining when my life is so good. God, forgive me for falling in love with the idea of uh, Brother Brother Leonard said it so philosophically to me on Friday and, and I hope he doesn't mind me sharing it. Uh, if he does, it's too late and I'll have to take a whooping after church. Uh, but he said uh, that you seem like so often in your life uh, there's this just one thing that if I could get it, it would make everything all right. 
He's not speaking of himself. He was speaking generally. But I related to it so profoundly, Sister Maria. How many times in our lives have we been been just kind of like, yeah, going through, walking through molasses, and, and you know, nothing, you know, nothing even makes you feel all that good or nothing makes you feel all that bad. It's just kind of like, Bleh. but if I could get this, everything would be fine. If I could get it, if I could get it, then everything would be fine. Some of you are even thinking about it now, possibly have said it in the last few days. But the conclusion that Brother Leonard and I came to in our conversation is when you get it, guess what? It all of a sudden turned into something else. Without self-denial, you aren't following Jesus Christ. And the only blessings you're getting are eating the scraps from the leftover baskets of five loaves and two fishes left over from a miracle. Haggai won from one. In the second year of Darius the king in the sixth month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua the son of Josedek the high priest, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time has not come. The people are saying, The time has not come. The time that the Lord's house should be built. The people have said, Please receive this, the word of the Lord. I had to practice what I preached this morning. Be not afraid. Open up your mouth and speak the word. For I am with you. The people are only have returned to Jerusalem, Brother Terry, because they were given permission to rebuild the house of the Lord. That's the only reason they're there. But through crossed up orders coming from the Persian court and through uh, opposition of the uh, 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 neighbors that are around them and through uh, uh, a failure to, to completely come together, they had different factions, but it was never rebuilt. And their catchphrase became, the time has not come. Which can be otherwise translated into, we don't have time. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Now I want you to listen to this very carefully. Because I'm speaking under the authority of the Holy Ghost to some folks that you have got ability that I wish I had. You have anointing that I wish I had. You have callings that I wish I had. You have talents and abilities that I wish I had. But I want you to listen. Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Next verse. You have sown much. But you bring in little. <laughs> you have sown much. But you bring in little. You eat. But you're not full. You drink. But you're not filled with drink. He clothes you, you put on clothes, but there's none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put them into a bag filled with holes. I hope you see the typology here. Do you? Do you see the typology here? There's nothing that's going on in your life that satisfies you. There's nothing going on in your life that satisfies you. You sow into the field, but it's not bringing forth what it's supposed to. You eat, but it's not, it's not doing for you what it's supposed to. 
You get a drink, but it's not satisfying that thirst like it's supposed to. You put on a cloak, but, but I'm not warm. And you make money, but you put it in a bag that there's holes in and it sprinkles out. There's never enough. I'm never satisfied. It just seems like the harder I work and the more... That... God have mercy. God have mercy! Why is everything not working for me? Why is everything falling apart for me? The prophet told it in the beginning. You focus so much on yourself and what you want and you neglected the work of the Lord and you do not see, you do not see that if you will focus on the work of the Lord, He will bless your life. I feel the power of the Holy Ghost on me so strongly tonight. Oh. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Please, you have got to understand that as a pastor, I do not come from a place of, of uh, complaint with this church, but I come from a place uh, of seeing so many with such unfulfilled potential who are always down at the mouth, uh, who always got a tear in your eye, who have always got a complaint uh, about something that's going on in your life. And the word of the Lord says, consider your ways. My desire, I have friends that pastor churches. I have friends that pastor bigger churches than this. I, I have friends that pastor denominal churches that are bigger than this and, and are older than this. And Sister Maria, they don't have a fraction of what we have. Not just up here on the pulpit, but of you, I'm talking to you that are here tonight. You've got ability, you've got talent, you've got so much. But you're not harvesting very much. You're making money, but you don't have nothing to show for it. You've got clothes, but you don't feel warm. My desire under the authority and the leading of the Holy Ghost. And, and Brother Billy, I have sat in my desk and I have, I, have, I have thought and meditated and dwelt over this very concept. Uh, and Brother Billy, you'll understand this. How is it that you see teams, uh, we both follow baseball, that you'll see teams that don't have the talent, that don't have the ability, that don't have the money to spend, but yet they win every year. Why is it? Because everybody Man, if you ignore me tonight, I feel so sorry for you. Get mad at me, buck up at me, rebel against me. I don't care. You're not rebelling against me, but you're rebelling against God. Because on a team like that, Brother Billy, everybody knows their role. And everybody does their job. And there's nobody that's out for their own numbers. Uh, they, you'll have a team that wins, no win, no MVPs. Uh, win no Cy Young Awards. Uh, but they're in the playoffs every year. They win every year. It's called a culture of winning. Uh, and it's because everybody comes together. And it is so my desire. It is so my desire that this church come together. Oh yeah, we're together in the same place. Uh, but that we lose uh, our propensity to get so wrapped up in our Ourself, uh, that, uh, uh, get, that we get scared to ask people how they're doing because we're scared they might tell us. Amen. There's so much potential in this church. There's so much potential in this church. Brother McKinney, I'm understanding. And I, I don't, I'm not betraying your confidence. I'm just going to tell you how you told it to me. Brother McKinney told me in 2012 when him and I began to try to write down how we were going to make this transition if you all voted me in as your pastor, which tonight you may be regretting that. Too late. But he told me, he told me, he said, Brother, I would a whole lot rather be starting to pastor in my day than in yours. I feel the Holy Ghost so strong on me. It's because the world, 
is so heavy on us. And we've got so much. I started thinking today or the last few days about, about the walk with God that people had, Brother Pete, they didn't have two dimes to rub together. They didn't have anything. They, matter of fact, they would all go to General Conference. You know what? I'm going to go to General Conference in Indianapolis in September. Sister Maria, I'm able to stop a half a dozen times between here and there and buy me a soda and buy me a slushie and get me an ice cream and I'm going to get me a hamburger and a cheeseburger and a taco and whatever I want. But those people that went to General Conference, they would like eight of them get in a car and they would pack picnic lunches uh, and they'd pull off the side of the interstate brother McKinney you've probably done that before and they would spread out food and they would eat right there they had nothing oh but they had a walk with God oh my goodness they had a walk with God they laid hands on the sick brother Terry and they were healed they went to nursing homes and baptized them and saw them filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost they laid hands on the job they walked through town and on their way to the post office somebody would flag them down and say pastor my baby's sick they would go over and they would lay hands on that child and they would be healed some of us, please hear me right now, I mean no disrespect, I would not preach this message if I did not think that there was some unbelievable talent. There's some of you that, oh, don't fall in love with this church because there's some of you that God wants to raise up to be a pastor of your own church. There's some of you that God wants to raise up to go work on the mission field. There are some of you that God wants to raise up to be ladies ministry director. There's some of you that God wants to raise up to be men's ministry director. There's some of you that God wants to raise up to be student pastors. There's some of you that God wants to raise up to do any number of things. But that cannot be all you aspire to. For so long, for so long, Sister Kelly, you came up in this same church, just different generations. For so long, if I could just get on the platform, I have arrived. If I could just get to singing in church, I've made it. In church of the living God, the Lord has not blessed us so we can keep it inside these walls. The Lord has blessed us that we've got you've got neighbors living all around you. Uh, uh, you know, Brother Derek has also been impacted by this. Uh, I forgot about you, brother. You're going to have to keep reminding me. But there's so many that have been impacted by what's going on in our community. And our church is bucking against the trend that's in our culture. <laughs> You don't believe that? Do you see it? Come on now, Brother Shannon can testify on a Wednesday night. On a Wednesday night, we had 400 people watch our service. Say, well, it ain't because we got talent. It ain't because we got ability. It's because there's some men and women that went on before us uh, that they spent their life on their knees, Brother Robbie. Uh, they spent their life pushing away from the table, preparing this kingdom for us to be able to reap its benefits. Haggai told the people, consider your ways. This was the first time in over two years, the first time that every slide on the 12 hours of prayer wasn't filled up. We have 151 people on our Sunday school book. The most people we've ever had sign up for 12 hours of prayer is 19. Say, well, here he goes. You got it. Consider your ways. Say, so, well, I had this happen. I had that happen. What happened in your life that couldn't have been fixed with prayer? <laughs> Next Sunday night, y'all going to make sure to shout me down. The biggest obstacle is not the devil, but it's us. Brother Terry, Brother Pete, and Brother Chris Kaiser went with us to men's conference. And Brother Hughes, anybody ever heard Brother Hughes preach? Don't go hear Brother Hughes preach if you don't mind your feelings getting hurt. 
what Brother Hughes said. He said, I hear this catchphrase with people in marriages. And they always...